Today on Connect with Skip Heitzig, we're excited to introduce you to our speaker, Joel Rosenberg. Joel is a Bible prophecy expert who has vast experience in Middle East affairs. He's taken the message of Jesus into some of the most hostile regions on earth. And today, he shares about the importance of prayer before witnessing to others. Our speaker today has a knack of writing tomorrow's headlines in his current books. Uh, he's been at this for a long time. Joel Rosenberg has authored 19 books. Um, uh, I also author books. The big difference is his make the New York Times bestseller list and the USA uh, bestseller list and another one he told me about, but I forget. Um, but uh, Joel, God has placed him in amazing places. He was just uh, last week, spoke at the Reagan Library and uh, speaks to dignitaries around the world as well as write, writes books. Um, I'm going to show you a picture as we start by way of introduction. This is uh, Billy Graham. This is his pastor, uh, Dr. Koshi. He'll talk about him. And that is Joel Rosenberg. That guy is going to speak to you in a minute. Do you think you can trust him? Does he have anything to say? Well, yes, he does. And uh, so would you please welcome our good friend, Joel Rosenberg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, sorry. Thank you. Younger, thinner. Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> that was something special. You know, you, very rarely you're going to get a chance in life to meet a modern day Apostle Paul. Right, and of course, Skip had a great joy and honor of, of not just meeting, but but really working with him and and, and, and being part of a ministry to reach the world for Jesus. And this is a big question we have in our lives. You know, whatever whatever your background, whatever whatever got you to Calvary, Albuquerque. You know, the question is one of the, one of the big questions in our lives is when we see Jesus face to face, is he going to be able to say to us, "Well done." my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. You understood that there's lots of options in life. There's lots of opportunities. There's lots of diversions. But you were faithful in a few things, like being a witness for Jesus, knowing him, but also making him known to everyone that you could. Making disciples, right? That's the great commission, the great final command of our, of our commander-in-chief. Go and make disciples of all nations. Right? Not just the easy nations, not just the simple nations, not just the friendly capitalist democratic nations, but the difficult nations, the, the dangerous nations, the deadly nations. Are we willing to go and make disciples of all nations? Loving, sharing, witnessing for Jesus and hoping that people make a decision for Jesus rather than against him. Obviously, Billy Graham said yes to that call, right? He was, he was, a, he was a kid, a farmer's kid from North Carolina. And God used him to take the gospel to more people than any human being in human history. Right? Skip Heitzig grows up in a surfing community, long hair, you know, living that Calvary Chapel life, pre-Calvary. <laughs> to be a Calvary Chapel, you've got to, like, spin out. You're lost. You're very, very lost, right? And... Uh, and you get radically saved. And God says, hey, I, I, I want to clean you up. I want to change you. I want to use you to reach a few more people. And, and in Skip's case, a lot more people. I didn't know that that was going to be my path. Um, I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm Jewish on my father's side, Gentile on my mom's side. So by biblical teaching, I, you know, very few Jewish people come to faith in Jesus. Right, Jesus, uh, John writes in John chapter 1, he came, he, the Messiah, came to his own. His own received him not. But to as many as received him, you, the Gentiles, to you he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You know, yes, 
Jesus' first followers were Jewish. Many of his first followers. I mean, not just the, not just the, the 12, actually the 11, but, but, uh, but, but, but many tens of thousands. But in time, most, most Jewish people resisted, and, and, and it was the Gentile world that opened to the gospel. And historically, most Jewish people have died and gone to hell without Jesus. Rejecting Jesus. No, we're not going to believe so when the Lord brought my father into the kingdom, my father's Jewish, my mom's not. My, my parents both got saved in 1973. When my father got saved in 1973, having been raised Orthodox Jewish, he thought he was the first Jew since the Apostle Paul who believed this. <laughs> he had never heard of a Jewish person that believed that Jesus is the Messiah. He'd never met such a person. And in 1973, there weren't that many. In fact, we've done a lot of research over the years, uh, myself and my colleagues, and, uh, and we've found that in, in 1967, the year that I was born, that's the best uh, data I think that we have at this point. In 1967, there were fewer than 2,000 Jewish people on the entire planet Earth that believed that Jesus is the Messiah. Fewer than 2,000. Today, based on a study that the, uh, my nonprofit ministry, the Joshua Fund, helped fund a, a massive a benchmark survey of American evangelicals that was released last year at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, we found using, uh, working through Lifeway Research, the Southern Baptist Research Arm, this massive study, we found there are now 871,000 Jewish followers of Jesus, Jewish evangelicals in the United States alone. The veil is coming off of our eyes. The, the, the partial hardening on the Jewish heart is, is being re removed by God. We're in a season where Jewish people, more Jewish people are listening, open to the gospel than at any other time in human history, and more are responding. In, in Israel alone, in 1948, when Israel was prophetically reborn as a sovereign nation state, there were only 23 Jewish followers of Jesus that were known in the entire country of Israel. 23. Okay, Jesus said as a Jew, as the Messiah in Israel, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But when you're down to 23, come on, you're getting, that's getting close to zero. And actually, some, several of these 23 are still alive today. I know several of them. It's extraordinary to meet. These are like meeting Christians off of the Mayflower, my friends. I mean, imagine knowing believers that helped found a country. If, if Israel were easy to reach with the gospel, it would be done by now. It's the first country. But our team has been, you know, fairly stiff-necked about this issue. We don't really want to accept Jesus. Uh, we don't even really want to read the scriptures. Most Jewish people have never read through the, the Bible. They don't, it, it, this is a problem. And, 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 and part of my life's mission is God has saved me because my parents got radically saved. Their marriage was radically saved. Then I got saved. I wouldn't call it radical. It didn't seem so radical to me at the age of eight, right? I, I, I wasn't I wasn't going down Skip's Road or most Calvary Chapel pastors. I wasn't using drugs, dealing drugs. I wasn't, you know, in a gang. I wasn't astral projecting into people's bedrooms. I was, you know, this was. I wasn't into New Age. Or, I, this was, wasn't me. I was eight. I mean, come on. I, um, so I. It didn't seem so radical when I got saved. But over time, I began to wonder what is my what is my unique calling. What does God, you know, I, I, I'm Jewish. I believe in Jesus. That's, that's unique in this world. Again, in a world where there weren't that many, now there's many more. We believe now there are about a million Jewish followers of Jesus worldwide. Now, in a world of 15 or 16 million Jewish people, a million's not enough. But you, but you see the, you know, you see this flat line of Jewish response to the gospel, and now you see this big spike. This is the time to be sharing the gospel. This is the time to be prayerfully and financially investing in the kingdom and making sure that every Jewish person in Israel and around the world has a chance to at least hear the mystery of the Messiah, that he's come, that Jesus is he, that he loves us, that he wants to adopt us into his family and make us part of the royal family. This is the time. And that's why I don't only write novels. I also started this ministry with my wife in 2006 called the Joshua Fund, which is essentially 
a, a venture capital firm, a spiritual venture capital firm. We invest prayerfully, financially, and in other ways in small but promising gospel-focused, gospel-preaching, disciple-making, pastor-training, church-planting ministries in Israel, in the Palestinian territories, and in five neighboring Arab countries, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. This is, our, this is the footprint that God has called us to focus on, to make sure that everybody has at least heard the gospel clearly in their own heart language, and they have an opportunity to say yes or no, receive or reject Jesus as Messiah, and to strengthen the local church to fulfill the Great Commission, to care for the poor and the needy, for widows and orphans, refugees, as well as teach the Bible, verse by verse, all the way through the scriptures, helping people who, who do know Jesus to grow and mature in a very difficult part of the world. This is, this is the two parts of my life. Making things up, that's the novel writing, and, and strengthening the church in the Middle East. That's, you know, and I would, I would drop the novel writing tomorrow, today, if God would just let me do the Joshua Fund, because I love this ministry so much. I love it, I love it, I love it. But the Lord said, look, that I, I am opening unique doors for you, Joel, not because you founded and, and, and are the chairman of a nonprofit ministry. You, you, I, you and your wife, I used you to found the ministry and recruit, train, and deploy a team to go focus on this. But that's not where I want you to spend most of your time. Most of your time, I want you writing novels. Really, Lord? I mean, just making things up. I mean, think about what it means to be a novelist. You're asking people to spend $28 and several days of their life to read something that is completely not true. We'll return to our message in just a moment. Recently, Skip Heisek had the opportunity to spend time with Joel Rosenberg, where they discussed a number of biblical and political topics. What observations would you make? What's the goal of, I, what, of Tehran at yeah. this point? What, what is their end game? What do they want? Right. Well, this is interesting because for a long time, you know that uh, cynics, sometimes reporters, columnists, look at evangelicals who study and teach Bible prophecy, and they say, oh, you guys are a bunch of lunatics. I mean, you know, thank God you're not running the yeah. country because yeah. you just like want to, you know, like you're all interested in the end of the world. Like, well, look, we... We believe that what the Bible says, that bad things are going to happen at the end of days, and then Jesus will return. But nowhere in the Bible that it says we're supposed to cause it. Uh -huh. but, the, but, the, but, we, but the leadership of Iran, the, the regime, the Ayatollah Khamenei, his eschatology is a photographic negative hmm. of biblical eschatology. Hmm. In other words, in some ways, it's, it's similar, right? So, you know, just like a, a photo and it's, and it's negative, you'd, you could say, well, uh, Joel, don't you believe uh, that uh, we're living in the, in the last days? I would say yes. Well, that's what the Ayatollah thinks. Well, don't you believe that the prophecies say we're getting closer and closer to the end of the end? Uh, I would say yes. Well, isn't that what the Ayatollah thinks? Well, uh, don't you think that you're supposed to live differently in light of the fact that the end is coming? And the, uh, yes, well, that's what they think. Well, don't you think that Jesus is coming back uh, as part of the end uh, of the end? That's what I believe. Well, so do they. That's what Muslims believe. That's what the crazies believe, you know, they would say. And, okay, all that's true, but there's a difference. The difference is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, This gospel, this good news of the kingdom, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end shall come. In other words, our mandate as we get closer to the return of Christ is to try to save every single person on the planet by at least giving them a chance to hear in their own heart language the good news that Christ came to die on the cross, forgive their sins, rise again, adopt them into his family. That's what we want to make sure everybody has heard that. What is their end game? They believe, the Ayatollah believes, in something called Twelver eschatology, meaning the Ayatollah and his clique believe that the way to hasten the coming of their so-called Messiah, the Mahdi, also known as the 12th Imam, and Jesus, who comes not as God, but as the deputy, mm -hmm. um, the way to hasten that is to annihilate two countries, Israel, which they call the little Satan, and the United States, which they call the great Satan. 
So I've got two bullseyes on me as a Boy. dual citizen. Yeah. Like they, wa they want to kill me. They don't care whether I'm Israeli, the little Satan, or American, the great Satan. But that's their, they, they want to kill as many people as possible because that, they believe, will usher in the paradise that they long for. Well, that's a photographic negative. That's the exact opposite of biblical eschatology. And all that to say, if you understand what the Iranian regime wants, that this is their goal to get to acquire by building, buying, or stealing nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them because it helps them commit the genocide they need to fulfill their end times prophecies, you would understand why uh, the Iran nuclear deal was insane. Yeah, I was going right? to just bring that up. So the idea of giving them one, how much? How much? 150, 150 billion, billion, billion dollars. Um, to, they didn't even have to sign the agreement. They just had to agree to it. Can you imagine? Uh, and, and so I, when I was with President Trump, I, he asked me, what's the, what's the summary of the Persian, Persian gamble? gamble? And I said, Mr. President, here's the elevator pitch, okay? Imagine what if the Iranian regime took the $150 billion that President Obama gave them to agree to this insane Iran nuclear deal that really just doesn't get rid of the Iran nuclear program, but sort of slows it down and delays its full Im implementation for between 10 and 15 years, three years of which have already gone by. What if the Iranian regime took the $150 billion and secretly went to North Korea, which already has 60 fully operational nuclear warheads. And what if Iran tried to buy off the shelf a half dozen of these warheads? What did he say? He said, wow, wow, well, how do you, and then he says, how do you know the Iranians aren't trying to do that right now? <laughs> now, sitting with me is the Vice President of the United States, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and the National Security Advisor. That's who's in this meeting, and me. <laughs> I mean, I was, when I first entered the meeting, I felt like the Sesame Street cartoon, one of these things is not like the other, <laughs> one of these things just doesn't belong. Like, wh what am I doing in this room? Like, but anyway, so, so the president said, how do you know that Iran's not already trying to do this? I said, well, I don't know that. I'm, I'm trusting, Mr. President, that you and the men in this room are working every day to make sure the Persian gamble never comes true. In the full interview, Skip and Joel Rosenberg discuss eye-opening developments in the Middle East, including the recent Christian delegation to Saudi Arabia and Egypt. When you give today to help expand the Bible teaching outreach of Skip Heitzig, we'll send you Skip's exclusive interview with Joel Rosenberg, plus Joel's full teaching from today's broadcast on your choice of CD or streaming link, as well as Skip's book, You Can Understand the Book of Revelation. Get your copies of these insightful resources when you give today to help connect more people to Jesus. Why am I, why am I a novelist? Well, the first reason is because I don't know how to do anything else. Okay, I, well, you're, I'm a failed political consultant. Everyone I ever worked for, every political leader, they lost. <laughs> or did very well, but years after I was involved in their lives. You're laughing because that's not your resume, but now apply that to every, uh, you know, client contact that you have. Failure, 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 failure. Oh, that doesn't sound so funny anymore, does it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was my life for about 10 years. And... Uh, and of course, I, you know, I, I, I realize over time that I'm one of the few Jewish people in America that didn't get the financial gene, okay? I'm not, I'm not your stockbroker, your accountant, your hedge fund manager. I don't know how to do those things. I never will. Uh, but I didn't get the other Jewish skill sets either. I'm not your doctor. I'm not your lawyer. I'm not your chiropractor, your acupuncturist. I'm not running a major movie studio, okay? The, the, the really fun, good Jewish skill sets, didn't get those, right? I, 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 am, I literally, my job is to make things up and to try to persuade you to, uh, to read it. Now, why do I do that? One, because I don't know how to do anything else. In my life, God had to shut a lot of doors so I would go through the one that he wanted me to walk through that was the good works that he'd pre prepared beforehand for me to, to serve him, okay? And, and I spent a lot of years of my life frustrated that he wasn't opening doors that I thought he should, that I wanted him to. But he opens the doors he wants to open. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, Colossians chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to a Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible. 
And I want to look at this passage as we look at God is opening amazing doors in the Middle East. Uh, he's, he's opening amazing doors uh, for followers of Jesus to, to build friendships with people who don't know Jesus. That's a conviction of mine. I believe that everybody in the world needs a friend who loves Jesus. Everybody in the world, regardless of their race, ethnicity, religious background, everybody needs a friend who knows and loves Jesus so that we can be a, a witness to them. Not to coerce them, not to deceive them, not to, not, not to not, you know, try to force them to believe what we believe, but to be a witness, to share what we know and how much we've been changed, how much joy and hope that we have, and pray that they would want what we have. Now, in Colossians chapter 4, Paul lays out some interesting principles for us. And I am now going to do what I used to tease my father for doing, um, but I have to do it because I'm old now. Okay. <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but it's close. Okay. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word for the word of God, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have been also uh, imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Paul is telling us that part of being a follower of Jesus is devoting yourself to prayer. Now, prayer sounds like a very religious activity, but it's not. It's conversation. It's talking with God and listening to God, right? If, if, you're, if, if you've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you don't talk to him or her, that's a sign of unhealthiness in the relationship. If you're not excited about waking up, or a spouse, obviously, or a child, if you're not waking up excited to talk to them, something is wrong in the relationship. Right? It, it, and we, we have a relationship with a God who's adopted us into his family. Didn't need to. We didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. If we say yes to the gospel of Christ, the invitation to get saved, we are now in his family. We happen to be in the royal family. Imagine being in a family where your father is the king. And he invites you every morning to come into his throne room and in the palace and sit and talk and share what's on your heart, listen to what's on his heart. And would you not do that? If you had an opportunity to go meet with a king wouldn't you do it? Um, now, in, in Skip's case, the answer is no. Uh, I invited him to come. <laughs> no, I'm teasing him, but uh, this is partially true. Uh, I, I invited him. I'm going to share with this in a little, in a little bit. Um, I've had these opportunities where God has opened the door for me to go meet with kings and presidents and prime ministers and crown princes in the Middle East as a follower of Jesus, to go meet with Muslim leaders. And I, I called him and I said, hey, I've got an opportunity to go to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and meet with these leaders as evangelicals. Would you like to come? He said, well, I'm really busy and I, you know, I have the church and there's lots of activities. I said, okay, no, no problem. And then, thank God, Lenya said, are you insane? What are you, God's opening a door? To go be a witness to the leaders of the Islamic world and I mean, I'm glad you love the church and here in, you know, in the congregation here in Albuquerque, but go, my friend. And, and so he called back and said, yes, I, I would like to go, and I'm very glad. And you'll understand why in a few minutes. God loves to open these types of doors, um, but he wants us to start by being in this relationship with God where we're willing to talk to him and listen to him. And it's, you know, if you got invited to the White House to meet with the president, whichever president, Whatever you think of them, would you not at least consider that this could be interesting? Maybe I could, be, maybe I could pray for this leader. Maybe I could be a witness to this leader. This happened to me a few weeks ago. I was, uh, well, let me just say I got invited to uh, have lunch with Vice President Pence. He and I have been friends. Our wives have been friends for many years. When he was back in the House of Representatives, uh, he and his wife were reading my novels. 
and they invited me to come to lunch and we started a friendship. And for years, we've been sending them advanced copies of the novels and then we'll go visit them and we talk about the books and it's very fun. And, um, and when he uh, became vice president, who knew? I mean, I didn't, he didn't expect to become the second most powerful person in the world. I didn't. And then, uh, so I, I, I've seen him, I don't know, four or five times since he took office. And uh, uh, four or five weeks ago, I was invited to come and have lunch with him at the White House. And it was a wonderful time to catch up personally, prayer requests, but also talk about what's going on with my novels and what's going on in the Middle East and what's in real life, what's happening with the administration. And at the end of the conversation, he said, uh, have you ever met the president? And I said, uh, no, I haven't. I've never even been in the Oval Office. He said, come follow me. Now, what was I going to say? You know what? I'm, I, there are YouTube videos I'd rather watch. <laughs> I'm a little behind on my emails and my Twitter account. You know, that's all fascinating, but I don't want to go sit and talk with the, the leader of the free world. I, you know, there's other things to do. I, I've got a busy day. It's nice to see you. You're my friend, but I mean, come on. Look, if you had an oppor opportunity to be invited into the Oval Office, I think you would go. The God of the universe is inviting you to spend time with him every day in, in, the, uni in, you know, in the palace, in the, in the Holy of Holies, in the Oval Office, as it were. How often we like, ah, I'm busy. Eh, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Right? How many times have we blown off our quiet times? Eh, I got other things to do. I'm busy. Really? You're too busy for the God of the universe? Look, I do it too. I, I'm, not, I'm not proud about it. But I'm saying, do we understand the way Paul understood. Paul was a religious terrorist. He got radically saved. He understood, I should be in hell right now forever with no way of escape. But I'm not. I got radically saved for no merit of my own. And now I'm an ambassador for Jesus. And I'm telling you, you should spend time with him. Devote yourself to prayer. And by the way, you should pray that God would open opportunities for you to go talk to people about Jesus. That's all we have time for today. Next time on Connect with Skip Heitzig, we'll continue our special Middle East update from Joel Rosenberg. And remember, with your gift to help expand the Bible teaching outreach of Skip Heitzig, we'll send you Skip's exclusive interview with Joel Rosenberg, plus Joel's full teaching from today's broadcast on your choice of CD or streaming link, as well as Skip's book, You Can Understand the Book of Revelation. Connect with Skip Heitzig is a presentation of Connection Communications, connecting you to God's never-changing truth in ever-changing times.